Warning, this review contains women alluding to some highly suggestive sexual innuendos and may not be suitable for immature or sexually confused audiences. Also, if you're afraid of taking baths or brushing your teeth, this review may not be for you. Viewer discretion is advised. Okay, now that all the unhygienic scum are out of the room, let's get to this review. Well, 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 who thought three months after my first review on Baki Monogatari, I would be reviewing the sequel to it now? I sure as hell didn't. Then again, I also thought that I had for sure that that review was going to land face first and result in me never attempting to make another anime review ever. But by some miraculous feat, I still remain here on the internet making these informational and occasionally even humorous reviews. So with that trip down memory lane over, it's time to kick this review into overdrive. So today on Holden Reviews, I'll be reviewing the much anticipated sequel to the 2009 cult hit Baki Monogatari, and that is Nisei Monogatari, directed by the king of crazy himself, Aki. Yuki Shimbo, who is most well known for his directorial roles in animes such as Maho Shoujo Madoka Magica, Sayonara Zenzibu Sensei, and Arakawa Under the Bridge, just to name a few, because this guy has seriously directed a lot of f***ing anime. And the animation is done by Studio Shaft. So with all the praise I gave Baki Monogatari for grabbing me by the hand and taking me out of my boring reality and bringing me on a vacation of a lifetime into a unique and interesting world, which I found myself not wanting to leave for even a moment, how can the sequel possibly measure up to its predecessor? Stick around and find out as we go on this tour through the unique and supernatural world of Nisei Monogatari. So for those of you who are new or unfamiliar with the story of Baki Monogatari, let me give you a brief rundown so that you can better understand the story of Nisei Monogatari and how it relates to Baki Monogatari. So the story of Baki Monogatari can be summed up as the events and interactions ex-vampire Koyomi Araragi has with girls who bear supernatural ailments, and how he and his middle-aged friend Meme Oshino are able to help cure these girls of their ailments, which can range anywhere from turning into a sexy cat lady or being rendered weightless due to the effects of a giant invisible crab. Now it is after all these events in Baki Monogatari that the story of Nisei Monogatari finally Finally take place. The story picks up right where the last one left off, with Senjo Gahara still being a verbally abusive bitch. Subasa is still the big-brained, busty beauty she used to be, and Koyomi still has a thing for sexually assaulting little girls. The focus of Nis Monogatari is on Koyomi's sisters Karen and Tsukihi, who made brief appearances during the first series whenever they got Koyomi out of bed and during the next episode previews, which in all actuality told you f all about the next episode, but I digress. We are told early on that the same con artist who deceived Senjo Gahara in the events before Baka Monogatari, named Kaiki, is back in town spreading the same evil incantations that once hurt Koyomi's friend Nadako. After finding out Kaiki is back in town, Koyomi's sister, Karen, tries to confront him and tries to get him right back out of town, and let's just say not everything goes according to plan. Also, in classic Baka Monogatari fashion, Nisa Monogatari is also divided in darks as well, where one heroine gets her time to shine on screen. The difference is that in Nis Monogatari there are only two arcs, each of which are about one of the Araragi sisters. In my personal opinion, this the story can tend to drag on at times, and at other times it seems like it's almost moving too fast, depending on how interested you, the viewer, are in the story and events at hand. Also, I feel like it is important to mention that this series is very heavy on dialogue, and if you hate reading, you should probably just get the fuck out right now. The story of Nismogatri is for the most part told through the well-written and often witty discussions between two characters, which in my opinion gives the story a very organic way of being told. One of the weird things about the dialogue between characters, though, is the length of the conversations themselves. The conversations can be up to 12 minutes in length at times, which I like to point out is a whole half an episode. Now, it's not what they say that is bad, but rather the characters do partake in these lengthy conversations, and they do for the most part stay in the same general spot. Now this can really lead to two things. One, you are very interested in the conversations and the time just seems to fly by, which I guess goes hand in hand with the old saying, time flies when you're having fun. Or two, you get bored and lose focus in the conversation and you would like to have the characters do something else rather than what appears to you as just sitting in the same spot and talking endlessly and time just seeming to slow down. Just as if you were anxiously waiting for a bell to ring and class to be dismissed, it feels like ages. But every time you turn and look at the clock, you see that only a few minutes have passed and you are left with a hollow feeling knowing that you still have 45 minutes of class left. Now it is because of the second reason that these long conversations do not appeal to everyone, especially for those who have a short attention span who need instant gratification every other minute or they just might shrivel up and die of boredom. I personally really liked Nis Monogatari's form of storytelling. As for the story itself, I found myself enjoying putting all the pieces of dialogue and exposition together to get one step closer to solving the mystery. And as a whole, although this story can be fairly weak at times, it for the most part makes up for it, and even if you find yourself getting bored, there is usually something soon after to re-spark your interest, or at least that's 
Kurosawa was for me. On a side note, as awesome a director as Akiyuki Shimbo is, I cannot give him credit for something he did not write, which in this case was the story for Nisimonogatari. The story was actually originally conceived by a man who goes underneath the pen name of Nisio Isen, which he loves to point out as a palindrome, or simply spelled the same backwards as it is forwards. He has written a lot of different works, but so far his only works that have been adapted into animes are the Bakamonogatari series, Katanagatari which has no relation to Bakemonogatari, and his newly aired series, Madaka Box. Overall, I would highly recommend checking out his works if you find yourself liking the anime adaptations of his work. Anyway, let's get back on track with this review. The characters of Nisimonogatari are arguably the most important part of the series because it is through them that the story is told. The cast of characters is almost the exact same as it was in Bakumonogatari with the exclusion of Meme Oshino, whom I have said before is just another anime version of yours truly. The main character of the show is the ex-vampire himself, Koyomi Araragi. Koyomi is a bit of an oddball protagonist if you ask me. Granted, he also has normal male teenage traits such as his newfound fascination with women, especially the soft and squishy parts of them, but one of the more interesting things that makes him unique is how his personality can change so much during a conversation. Now first this may come off as him being a bit schizophrenic or bipolar, but you'll soon see that this is merely the way he acts and nothing more. He is in my opinion a very interesting character and very funny despite how weird he may act. Now for the two main heroines in the series who happen to be Koyomi's little sisters, Karen and Tsukihi Araragi. Now Karen is the older of the two and who is extremely strong and a martial artist as well and kind of a tomboy who also loves being outside. She can also be a bit of a hothead who usually does things without thinking. The younger sister Tsukihi on the other hand likes the indoors and is quite frequently changing her hairstyle and kimono that she wears. She can also be quite short tempered but this leads to her being a quite funny character for the same reason I've found Koyomi's back and forth attitude to be quite funny. Together Karen and Tsukihi are both quite unique characters in my opinion. The next character is Hitagi Senjugahara, who is Koyomi's girlfriend through the series and is a bit of a tsundere, or for use of a more understandable word, a bitch. She can be cold and quite cynical towards others, and although she for the most part treats Koyomi like shit with all the degrading and things that she says about him, she can really change at times into a really sweet and loving girl. Her and Koyomi's love-hate relationship makes for the two of them to be a very interesting couple and really fun to watch in my opinion. Next up, we got Koyomi's classmate and close friend Tsubasa Hanakawa. Hanakawa is considered by Koyomi to be the ideal woman, which is something he would never tell Sanjogahara in the fear that she might overreact and cut off his, you know. That being said, Hanakawa is a smart and beautiful girl whose knowledge is extremely diverse. And due to how smart she is, she is also quite frequently called upon by Koyomi to give him an advice whenever he needs it most. Overall, she was one of my favorite characters because I have to agree with Koyomi in the statement that she's pretty much the ideal woman. And let's just hope that my girlfriend doesn't see this review, otherwise she might overreact as well and, you know. Then we got Shinobu Ushino or the Kiss Shot Ace Rolla Orion Heart Under Blade if you want to be a pretentious c*** about it, who was also a vampire and the reason Koyomi became a vampire in the first place who is now actually bound to his shadow oddly enough. Now this is due to Meme aka me taking away most of her powers leaving her as an 8 year old version of her former self. Now unlike in Bakemonogatari where she didn't say a single word, in this series she's actually quite talkative. She like Senjigahara is a bit cynical and acts like she's superior to just about everyone. I like seeing her more of a character than she was before so all the changes that are done to her are in my opinion welcome changes indeed. The remaining characters although interesting and have a bit of depth to them due to Bakemonogatari really take the sidelines in this series. Much like Senjigahara and Hanakawa who although have somewhat important roles are as important as they used to be in Bakemonogatari. The final girls are Nanako Sengoku, the younger who has a crush on Koyomi since he saved her in the last series. Kamburu Saruga, the star basketball player who has way too many sexual fetishes and is admittedly a lesbian. And finally, Hashikuji Mayoi, who is the 5th grader who is often sexually assaulted by Koyomi and usually just wanders aimlessly around town. Oh yeah, she's got a fucking weird ass backpack. All in all, it's a pretty solid cast of characters if you ask me, but if I was to make one complaint, it is this. In Bakuman and Gatru, they were all for the most part strong-willed and great examples of women empowerment, but in this series they seem way more sexualized, I guess. My case in point is that they try to make just about everything Thing that they do in this series over sexualized. Anything from playing Twister to taking a bath or even brushing your teeth is presented in such a way that it is obvious that they were meant to invoke someone to get the weirdest boner ever.
much fun, I hate to stop. But while I'm brushing my teeth and having so much fun, I never let the water run. No, I never let the water run. Whoa, 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 whoa. Can, can we see that last one again? Oh, I'm brushing my teeth. Can you also change the music while you're at it? Uh, does anyone else have a sudden urge to become a dentist? This to me was the only real big problem I had with the series. Other than that, it's still the characters that we came to know and love in Bakuman and Gatari. Now, the artwork in this series is truly one of the things that really makes the series really stick out. The only way you can really describe the artistic styling of the show is very jumpy and it appears very random at times. Now, the best way to describe this is by saying that the show has a hell of a lot of unconventional cuts or at least very unnecessary jump cuts, in which like, it can be very hard to follow what the f*** is exactly going on or being shown at any given moment. But if you've seen Bakuman and Gatari or any other anime made by Chef or directed by Akiyuki Shimbo, you've most likely seen or are familiar with what the series has to offer. I personally really like the rather crazy visuals and find them to make this anime a very unique viewing experience. Now, in terms of background, this show is rather simplistic, but at the same time, very stylized. I say this because although the place may be just a room with white walls, it's its accents and strange objects that really makes the rooms different from each other. As a whole though, there is actually quite a variety of landscapes, so I found myself not really getting bored at any certain area too frequently. Overall, the color palette for this anime is more on the warmer side of the spectrum, but that is most likely due to the fact that this series takes place during the summer, so the warmer colors really are well used in this case. Now, the character animations in this series are absolutely amazing in my opinion. The character's fluidity as they moved, which to be fair, no one really seemed to move that much anyway, but when they did, it looked smooth as silk. At the same time, some of the facial expressions that characters can do are really quite weird, but at the same time can be fairly funny as well. Also, another really cool thing that Studio Shaft did was that they actually tried to make the camera appear as if it was getting closer to a character, which in itself is a very hard effect to pull off, but very cool looking at the same time. And although it can look a bit clunky at first, I have to applaud them nevertheless for their great attempt at trying to pull off such a hard effect which you rarely see in anime nowadays. So as far as I'm concerned, Nisimonogatari took what made Bakumonogatari look good, kept it, and made it even prettier. So, no complaints from me. Now I'm not even going to begin what would start to be the worship session for how awesome these voice actors are and how they perfectly embody their characters. But I would like to give a special shout out to Hiroshi Kamiya, who is the voice of Koyomi, who in my opinion had the perfect range of tones and emotions to accurately portray the many emotions of Koyomi. Also, I'd like to say that for some reason I found myself really liking the performance of Karen's voice actor, Eri Kitamura, who has done roles such as Sayaka from Madoka Magica, Takagi from High School of the Dead, and my personal favorite, Saya from Blood Plus. Like I said before though, I feel everyone did a really good job with their characters, and I could not have asked for a better cast of characters to portray the equally interesting group of characters. As far as the soundtrack goes, it's actually really good and set the mood for scenes very well. It does recycle some songs from the Bakumonogatari soundtrack, but that is okay and it's only a few tracks after all. For the most part though, the musical score in this one Gatari is very diverse and uses its music in a way that really complements the subject or conversation between characters. So is the soundtrack good? Well, in my opinion, yeah, I'd actually say it's pretty good and actually really well used. But at the same time, the series also loved to have no background music at times and instead just the sounds of characters talking, which in my opinion was just a missed opportunity where they could have used background music to build yet another layer of emotion during these conversations, but I digress. On a side note, I'd like to mention how I personally really liked the opening themes by all the voice actors and the ending theme, which was a collaboration between Super Saiyan and Claire Reese, which are my two favorite J-pop bands, so the ending theme was really kind of a match made in heaven for me. But that's just my personal opinion, so let's get back on track with this review. Now odds are, if you're a fan of Bakumonogatari, you really didn't even need to watch this review because you've most likely already watched this whole series. If you've not seen Bakumonogatari though, I would highly recommend watching it first to help you avoid getting more confused than you already would be if you try to watch this series without any prior knowledge on it. But on the off chance that you have yet to see this show but you have seen Bakumonogatari, I would like to offer you a word of caution. Do not make the same mistake I did and think that this series was going to be just like Bakumonogatari because for some reason or another, it just didn't give me the same feeling Bakumonogatari did. That being said, I got over all my preconceived notions around episode 5 and from there on I began to really like the series for what it is, not what Bakumonogatari was. So much like the love-hate relationship that Koyomi and Senju Gahara have, I in the same way share the very same relationship with this show. It can make me frustrated, confused, even angry, and at times I wonder why I even liked this series in the first place. But when this series slows down and lets me know it still loves me, all the pain and anger up until that point just seem to dissolve and I'm left in a state of pure bliss in a rekindled passion for the series I fell in love with. 
So, on the whole review scoreboard, in which all scores are out of 10, Miss Monogatari receives a fairly average 7.7 for Stoi, for starting off fairly weak but progressively getting better as time went on. A slightly above average 8.2 for characters due to the fact that some of the characters either didn't get enough screen time or just seemed less about female empowerment and more about spicy fan service. A high above average 8.8 .8 for animation for taking what worked from the old series and building upon it and as a result turned out being better looking than the first series but keeping its unique sense of style that I loved so much. Sound receives a somewhat above average 8.3 for its amazing voice acting and good soundtrack but not using it to its fullest potential. And my overall enjoyment of the series receives a 8.6 for boring me at first but coming back to really wow me later on and making me really fall in love with this series all over again. Making the final score for Nismogatari a very respectable 8.32 and receives a stamp of Holden Approves. So that's it for the review of Nis Mangatri, I really hope you enjoyed it and if you did be sure to thumbs up this video and if you haven't already be sure to subscribe. Also be sure to leave your comments, questions, and recommendations in the comments section below. So I'm Holden from Holden Reviews and until next time, sayonara, see you later.